Well, the sawdust smells so good to me And the whiskey poured like rain There was an orange glow in the New York snow With the laughter and the pain And kids said, Sam, when you become a man There'll be a new day coming on Play guitar for yourself, don't you mind the rest They'll be here, but they'll be gone I knew Sam who was a Marxist And Phil the soldier too And I remember all the ideals But we drink to the revenues And there was one who made it lucky And there was one who took his life But there was drink to cloud confusion For the kid who did survive It's the kettle of fish tonight and we'll drink by the candlelight And talk of wars and greed and tours And the power and the might It's the kettle of fish in circles By a drunken village dawn And the crowd grows thin as the sun pours in And all my friends are dead or gone Well, I knew Tim, who was a wobbly And we drank to the fifty years From barroom fights to gold mine strikes How laughter turned to tears And when the waiter said, hey, Tim, let's go You drank too much for now We trade songs in a local cafe And the kid was in a cloud Well, my feet were cold like the sawdust And my eyes were red with tears Like the morning news and the country blues There was conflict in the air And are you happy writing songs of love As you watch the dawning light But you'll miss the walk to the beer and talk In the kettle of fish tonight It's the kettle of fish tonight and we'll drink by the candlelight And talk of wars and greed and tours And the power and the might It's the kettle of fish in circles By a drunken village dawn And the crowd grows thin as the sun pours in And all my friends are dead or gone Kettle of fish. Thank you. Thank you. That's the kettle of fish behind me. And uh, the kettle of fish was uh, a bar on McDougal Street. Now, a few blocks away was the White Horse Tavern, and, and that's where all the, the playwrights, the uh, British playwrights like uh, uh, Brendan Behan, well, he was Irish, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Dylan Thomas, you know, people like that, they drank themselves to death. Well, the Le Kettle of Fish was all the, where all the folk singers drank themselves to death, you know, but they didn't get as much publicity as the, uh, as the others. Anyway, um, it was 1962, and, uh, and I was, uh, had a love of folk music. I also had a love of the Beach Boys, but I didn't tell any of my friends. Um, and... Uh, so I used to go down to the village, and I loved going down to the village. Greenwich Village at that time was just a beautiful old Italian neighborhood, and there were nooks and crannies, great food, and, and bookshops that had, like, New Directions paperbacks, you know. It was like, it was, it was beatnik heaven. It was fantastic. And there were record stores that were just, uh, of course, nothing like this. This, by the way, is incredible. And <laughs> this... 
this is like a this is like a dream come. I mean, literally, I would dream of Tom's store. You know, when this is the kind of like anyway. Let me get not get into that. You know, so. But um, so the, the the kettle of fish was here. We are in the middle of McDougal Street and uh, early '60s. Of course, I didn't. I've had I had pro, uh, phony proof. But you'd walk down McDougal Street in those days, and um, and there was uh, the smell of uh, Galois cigarettes and and uh, incense and stuff like that, and uh, and you could smell the uh, espresso uh, coming out of the, the the coffee coming out of the fat back black pussy cat and the Cafe Figaro, all the little all the little cafes along the street, next to the uh, to the the cat the the, uh, the kettle of fish. Oh my God! <laughs> no, I I wasn't that young when uh, I uh, I couldn't get. The... Oh, what are these things doing here? Oh, those are my parents. Um, actually, when you think about it, you know the the, the shirt that uh, my my uh, father is wearing. What did what did they used to call it? Wife beater. A wife beater. <laughs> think about that these days. Um, this was me at, uh, in, uh, singing uh, at uh, weddings and bar mitzvahs in Schenectady, New York, where um, I grew up for five years of my life. And um, that's when I started singing. And behind me is the Earl Pudney Trio. Earl is playing piano. He was the local, uh, his, you know, if you had a, any kind of function, you hired the Earl Pudney Trio. Um, Earl's problem was that if he looked at one of the musicians too fast, his too fast, his, Toupe would go flying across the room. <laughs> now, this is the Folklore Center, and this was right next to the Kettle of Fish. Uh, you walked upstairs. The Kettle of Fish was on street level. The Folklore Center, you walked upstairs. Um, the person uh, in front there is, is Izzy Young, and he owned the Folklore Center. Never made a dime from it, even though they sold guitars and, uh, and uh, broadside magazines, sing-out magazines. It was the folk... folk the Folklore Center, and but it was a hangout for everybody, all the musicians in the village, and so you hung out at the Folklore Center. You know, nobody ever bought anything, but uh, um, and uh, but he's, Izzy was uh, Izzy passed on a couple of years ago, and then it's it's funny because I was watching the other night for some reason I was watching well for some reason it's a great movie, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which was the original was done in Sweden. And there's a scene uh, in the synagogue, and 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 uh, Izzy sitting in a pew, <laughs> so he was friendly with I guess the crew. Um, on the other side, downstairs, next near the Cattle of Fish, was the Gaslight Cafe, and this was where I hung out. This is where, you know, I longed to be, and I would go down there and and have myself a, a, a cappuccino or something like that. They didn't serve liquor. And I would watch Ramblin' Jack Elliott and Tom Paxton and Noel Stuckey, who was, uh, uh, became Paul from Peter, Paul, and Mary, and all of these wonderful people, Len Chandler, uh, these fabulous. And I would sit there and I would say, I love this stuff. You know, I just loved um, the, the roots music that was alive in Greenwich Village at the time. But my favorite was uh, the guy who ran the Hootenannies, and that was Dave Van Ronk. And... Um, uh, Dave was pretty scary. Uh, he was like, he was he was over six feet, like six feet two or six foot three, and he was like a bear, and he had a kind of constant, you know, scowl on his face, you know. So you were afraid to walk up to to, to Dave, but I did, and um, he was uh, actually a twenty seven year old communist was what uh, Dave was. He was a wobbly. I had I had mentioned uh, uh, the, the the something workers of the world. And that was Tim, who was a wobbly. I changed his name. But uh, that was Dave. And I walked up to him and begged him to give me a guitar lesson. And uh, he said yes. And I, I spent uh, two and a half years taking lessons from Dave. Um, I would go up to his apartment on 15th Street. He and, and, and uh, his wife, uh, Terry, had, a, had, an, had an apartment. And uh, Terry managed uh, Bob Dylan at the time and some other artists. And so Dylan would be sleeping on the Van Ronk's couch, you know, like half the time I would go up, go up there. But uh, Dave taught me a whole style of finger picking, 
and uh, he was he was he could be really nasty with his students and I would come back the next week if I if I wasn't ready with my with my lesson sorry I'm grabbing my glasses here if I wasn't ready with my lessons uh, he, he would like uh, I would have to I would start shaking because he would say what's the matter with you you're playing terribly I would go I'm sorry Dave I'll do whatever you want me to do you know and he whipped a lot of people in, into line. Um, later on, my co-band member, Danny Cal, took lessons from Dave also. But he was great. Uh, I got very close with Dave and Terry, and I used to go out to, they used to take me to socialist party uh, parties, and it was just a whole experience unto itself. I didn't wind up in any dossiers, thank God. Anyway, this is one of the songs that Dave taught me. Um, and I'm doing this because, you know, I, I want this stuff to live on. Some of these songs are so wonderful. And um, this is Candyman, and he taught me this style backpicking. Where you start off with the G string and then go backwards, unlike what Reverend Gary Davis taught me, which was front picking. So this is the backpicking version of Candyman, which is around the turn of the century, uh, and the you know the other century, and um, it was sort of a nonsense song, but you know people have said it was about prostitution or drugs, you know, and it's from New Orleans. But it's really sort of a a, a, a nonsense song, and and uh, Candyman been here and gone. Candyman, been here and gone. Candyman, been here and gone. Do anything in this God Almighty world to get my Candyman home. Candyman, salty dog. Candyman, fattening hog. Candyman. Salty dog If you won't be my candy man You're gonna be your fattening hog Run and tell the pitcher Get the baby some beer Run and get the pitcher Get the baby some beer Run and get the pitcher Get the baby some beer Run and get the pitcher Get the baby some beer Run and get the pitcher Get the baby some beer Run and get the pitcher Get the baby some beer I wish I was down in New Orleans Sitting on my candy stand Candyman Been here and gone Candyman Been here and gone Candyman Been here and gone Do anything in this God Almighty world To get my Candyman home Little red wagon painted green, 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 little red wagon painted green. You stop on the red and you go on the green, don't you mess with Mr. Mindapteen. Candy man, been here and gone. Candyman, been here and gone. Candyman, been here and gone. Do anything in this God Almighty world to get my Candyman home. Candyman. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the um, uh, one of the great things about. Uh, my childhood, actually, uh, or, or the things that I've lived through, um, was meeting some of the great blues artists of the of the time that were rediscovered. I'm talking mainly about Skip James, Sun House, and Mississippi John Hurt, who I who I got pretty close with. But to meet these people, I mean, I still listen to their records. Uh, they were like idols of mine, and I got to meet them. And uh, I'm going to do. If you never heard like Skip James. Or any of these guys, go out and get a record. Or, well, yeah, you don't have to go out and get a record. <laughs> I'm, 
this is incredible, this is surreal, you know, being around all this fabulous music. Anyway. This is a song by Skip James. Crow Jane, Crow Jane, why do you hold your head so high? You know, someday, baby, you're bound to die. I'm gonna get me a pistol, 40 pounds a ball. I'm gonna shoot my Crow Jane Lordy just to see her fall. Crow Jane, Crow Jane, why do you hold your head so high? Someday, baby, you're bound to die. Well, I lowered her down in a great long silver spade. Ain't nobody gonna take my Crow Jane's place. And I lowered her down With a great long golden chain With every link I would call Miss Crow Jane's name Crow Jane, Crow Jane Why do you hold your head so high? Someday, baby, you're bound to die well, you don't miss your water Until your well runs dry I didn't miss Crow Jane, Lord, until the day she died Crow Jane, Skip Jane Thank you Thank you I know what you're probably thinking, you're probably thinking Hey, the guy was in the Blues Project and Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Why is he doing all of this folk shit? And uh, <laughs> well, just, this is the, this is my career, you know. You just uh, um, and just you know to to make you feel. Uh, we'll get to that part of it in a little while, uh, but I will for now play you the. Uh, uh, my this is my guitar part, the spinning wheel, just to keep it you interested. <laughs> and people come up to me over the, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. It was nothing. Literally nothing. Um, and people come up to me over the years and they say, uh, geez, you guys did a lot of drugs in those days. And I said, well, if you had to play that every night for, for six years, you'd be doing a lot of drugs also. Anyway. Okay, so. And as a folk musician, and as, you know, we, we used to hang around um, uh, Gertie's Folk City, which was also another place like the Gaslight. And... Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna do it. Every folk musician should do, have a murder ballad in their uh, repertoire. And I. I this is a, a valid point here for me to do a murder ballad. Uh, you know, and the reason is is because I sat in with Clarence Ashley and Tex Isley. Clarence Ashley actually is attributed to writing this song that I'm gonna do called Little Sadie, which you may have heard. And um, it's an old timey song, but I actually. He was playing at the, uh, he and Tex Isley were playing at, the, at Gertie's Folk City, and all of us kids would be downstairs, you know, jamming and stuff like that. And I was playing washboard at the time. And uh, Clarence said, uh, hey, come on and play a song with us, you know, the washboard. And uh, I did. So I actually jammed on a... timey music song. Went out last night to take a little round. I met a little Sadie and I blowed her down. Went right home, went to bed. Forty-four smokeless underneath my head.
I begin to think what a deed I'd done. I grab my hat and away I'd run. I begin to run just a little bit slow. They overtook me in Jericho. Standing on the corner, ringing the bell, up step the sheriff from Thomasville. Says, young man, is your name Brown? Remember the night you shot Sadie down? Well, oh yes, sir, my name is Lee. I murdered little Sadie in the first degree. First degree, second degree. Got any papers, will you read them to me? They brought me downtown and they dressed me in black Put me on a train and they sent me back Had no one to go my bail They locked me up in that county jail Judge and the jury took the stand Judge had the papers in his right hand Forty-seven days, forty-seven nights, forty-seven years to wear the ball and stripes. Clarence Ashley. Thank you. Oh God, please don't break one of my strings. Anyway, um, Mississippi John Hurt, and I'll, I'll go more into my relationship with John. We were out in L.A. together, and, and um, oh, I forgot I had, sorry, Dave. Um, and that was one of my teachers also, was Reverend Gary Davis, and I used to go up to the South Bronx to take lessons from, from Reverend Davis, and he taught me the other version of Candyman. Uh, Reverend Davis was an amazing uh, blind Gary Davis. He would go out in the streets of New York and and play um, in Midtown, and uh, and people used to steal from him. They stole a guitar once from him, and uh, you know he lived in a hovel with his wife Annie, and uh, on Sundays he would preach, and then a stroke of luck, uh, Peter Paul and Mary recorded one of his songs. And uh, with the royalties, he was able to uh, move to a nice house in uh, Queens. Um, and there is Clarence Ashley, who is responsible for the song I just sang. And there's Skip James, who is responsible for the song I sang before on the right. And there's Mississippi John Hurt on the left. And Mississippi John Hurt was, um, was the most one of the most wonderful people I've ever known. And uh, I'm gonna do a version of his song now called uh, Richland Woman Blues. Give me red lipstick and a bright purple rouge, a shingle bob hairdo and a bottle of booze. Hurry down, sweet daddy, come and blow your horn. If it gets too late, 
Sweet mama will be gone Went to the fashion shop I found the one I like best Your own sweet mama Wants a brand new dress Hurry down sweet daddy Come and blow your horn If it gets too late Sweet mama will be gone Every Sunday morning You ought to see me go My wings spread out And preacher told me so Hurry down sweet daddy Come and blow your horn If it gets too late Sweet mama will be gone Well, the roosters say Cock-a-doodle-doo And the rich girls say Any doodle-doo Hurry down, sweet daddy Come and blow your horn And if it gets too late Sweet mama will be gone John Hurt Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now. Ah. The people in this photo are the Memphis Jug Band. And um, Will Shade and the Memphis Jug Bands. Will Shade uh, up front, I, I believe. And uh, they used to record in the 1920s, and they were amazing. Um, getting back to Greenwich Village and uh, and those days, um, I was a, I was I had a lot of friends. Uh, there were there were groups of people my age. We were like the generation uh, before before or after uh, Dylan and and uh, Dave and and those guys, and. We wanted to play music together, and we decided that uh, because we were, there was a blues faction and there was the old-timey bluegrass faction, I was in the blues, the blues faction, and we decided to play jug band music. That would be the common denominator, and so we did a lot of uh, uh, Memphis jug band, uh, Cannon's Jug Stompers, and um, and we 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 put together a band called the Even Dozen Jug Band. And there we are on the, uh, there we are. Mm -hmm. And that was our, <laughs> that was our album. Um, I believe Tom has 36 copies of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so we were, we, we, you know, it was, it was incredible because like some people would, five people would show up for rehearsal and the next day 15 people would show up for, but we were all in college, we didn't care, you know, so. Uh, the record company said, well, we want you to make a record. So he said, okay, and you're, you have to show up for the uh, album cover. So we did the album cover, and uh, only 11 people showed up. So the girl, the girl on the right is Marlene, I think was her name. She wasn't in the band at all. She was just, we, just, we just pulled her in for the photo. Um, but the band was terrific. On, uh, on, on the left is uh, Maria D'Amato. Um, and Maria, we had a party with the Queskin Jug Band um, that the record companies, both our record companies threw, and Maria met Jeff Muldor, and they got drunk, and Maria threw up all over Jeff, and uh, she, and he asked her to marry him. I don't know how your marriage proposals went, but mine was a little bit different than that. <laughs> so she became Maria Muldor. Um, then you have uh, John Sebastian is sitting up there with his harmonica case. John was in the band. And 
I'm sort of like, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere in there. I'm sitting, yeah, I'm sitting on the uh, ladder, you know. And up on top, you have uh, Josh Rifkin, and Josh had a, a big hit album with the Scott Joplin piano rags, which Tom only has 600 copies of. And, and they only printed 500, that's what's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I giving away a secret? Um, to the right is David Grisman, the great mandolin player. And so uh, we had a, you know, we were the Even Dozen Jug Band, and uh, this is the first song on the uh, on, on the side one. Take your fingers off it, don't you dare touch it. You know it don't belong to you. Take your fingers off it, don't you dare touch it You know it don't belong to you Two old maids laying in bed One turns over to the other and says Take your fingers off it, don't you dare touch it You know it don't belong to you Take your fingers off it, don't you dare touch it You know it don't belong to you Take your fingers off it, don't you dare touch it You know it don't belong to you A nickel is a nickel and a dime is a dime I got a house full of children and none of them's mine Take your fingers off it, don't you dare touch it You know it don't belong to you Take your fingers off it, don't you dare touch it, you know it don't belong to you. Take your fingers off it, don't you dare touch it, you know it don't belong to you. I never been to heaven, but I've been told St. Peter taught the angels how to jelly roll. Take your fingers off it, don't you dare touch it, you know it don't belong to you. I mean, you know it don't belong to you. I love that stuff. Uh, hopefully people will keep doing that, you know, and as, as we pass on, you know. That it's such a great tradition of American acoustic music. Um, speaking of which, um, when we did the jug band uh, thing, uh, I, had a, I did a song that, well, Maria and I did a, a bunch of duets on the album. But there was one song I wanted to do, but I, I didn't really have it worked up that well at that time. It took me 60 something years to, to work it up. No, it didn't take that long. It took a couple of nights. Anyway, um, the, uh, it's a Bessie Smith song. That's Bessie Smith. And uh, it's still one of my favorite songs. And I think one of the most beautiful songs ever written. Um, it's called Young Woman Blues. And the words are just. Uh, so simple and beautiful and uh, woke up this morning chickens crowing for day fell down the right side of my pillow my man had gone away well bye his pillow he left a note he said the reason I'm leaving Jane you got my goat well now there's no time to marry no time to settle down well I'm a young woman ain't done running a Well, I'm a young woman, I ain't done running round. 
Some people call me a hobo some name Call me a bum, nobody knows my name Nobody knows what I done Well I'm as good as any woman in your town Well, I ain't no high yellow and I ain't no kind of brown. Well, I ain't gonna marry, ain't gonna settle down. I'm gonna drink good moonshine and run these browns down. You see that long, lonesome road. And you know it's got to end Well, I'm a young woman And I can get plenty of men You see that long, lonesome road And you know it's got to end Well, I'm a young woman And I could still get plenty of men Bessie Smith Thank you. Okay, so the uh, the jug band uh, broke up, and well, we didn't break up. We were uh, our, our record company. We had a meeting out on the street in front of the Chelsea Hotel. It was just, we, we used to rehearse next to it, and um, our record company, Jack Holzman, who ran the owned the company, said, "Hey, you guys, we want you to go on the road." Uh, you know, you, we want you to make another album. We want you to go on the road. This thing is really getting hot, this jug band thing. And we want, we want to take advantage of it. And we said, screw you, Jack. We're going back to school. <laughs> so we broke up. <laughs> we, we did do, uh, well, we did do Carnegie Hall. And that's me and Maria. Maria. That was my trusty washboard. Um, this was the uh, poster, or a flyer for uh, Carnegie Hall, where we opened for Nina Simone and Herbie Mann. And it's funny because uh, Hilly Crystal from CBGB's was the stage manager. And <laughs> so after we broke up, uh, Stefan and I, Stefan Grossman was, was the guitar player in uh, the Jug Band. We went out to California to... Uh, we had a 52 Mercury um, that had a broken fuel pump, and we took uh, instruments, folk instruments, with us, acoustic instruments, and uh, we loaded the car up. We had no money, and we went to we wanted to go to Berkeley, and along the way we would sell the instruments. So we we, we went out into Vernal, Utah, and I and I would you know we would take turns driving. Right, it was my turn to drive through Vernal, Utah. And the, the guys were crazy. You know, they, I drove them crazy because the way I drive is I like to look out the, the wind. I like to look at the scenery. I'd never been past New York, so it was fun to look at. That's how I drove, looking out the window. And they, they would pull me back and say, could you please look at the road? And, no, I'm enjoying this. Anyway, um, so we got stopped by a police car in Vernal, Utah. For Our lights were, our, one of our tail lights was out. And... Um, and of course, it was like frightening, and and because uh, this is like you know, the civil rights time when when the guys were going down to, to uh, the, the freedom rides and people were getting beat up and stuff like that, and here we are with longish hair hair and folk instruments, in a '52 Mercury, and so the cop stops us, he says to me, 
I want you to get in, the, in, in our car, in the patrol car. So I go into the patrol car, and I'm shivering, right? Like, what's going to happen to us? And this, this is like in the desert. And the other cop comes back. And he turns to the, to the first cop, and he says, should we have him play a song for us? <laughs> At that point, I peed in the back seat. <laughs> Thank God before they noticed it, they let us go because their shift was up. But there was a little puddle left. In, uh... I still look at the vernal news, you know, from those days where there's nothing about a, a little beatnik puddle, you know, like laying in the back of... Uh... Anyway, so we went to, uh, we went to California and uh, we played uh, some gigs in, in Berkeley. Uh, I'll never forget, we played one gig at the... Uh, I forgot the name of the place, but uh, uh, John Fahey uh, was opening the show. And uh, Fahey, he, he got up to the microphone, he belched into the microphone and then started his set, you know, which I thought was like, you know, so this is show business. <laughs> and <laughs> so then we, we, we took a... a, a we took a, a, a truck down to a pickup down to L.A., because we got ourselves a gig at uh, Ed Pearl's Ashgrove Club, which was the club in L.A. at the time. And um, so we got a gig, and we were staying at Ed Pearl had given us his mother's, was, his mother was gone for the, for the summer. So we stayed at her apartment, and John Hurt had just finished a week there and wasn't doing anything for another week, so John was with us. So we spent a, spending a week with Mississippi John Hurt was just like, he was so fantastic. He was such a wonderful guy. He was sort of like my other father. And um, he was just so terrific. And uh, whenever you see him, you know, with that little pork pie hat and his smile, that's the way he was. Wonderful, wonderful guy. So uh, Stefan and I uh, went, we were gonna play the Ash Grove and we ran into this kid, you know, hanging out at McCabe's, probably, the guitar place. And the kid was great. And we were playing music together. It really worked out pretty well, you know, playing ragtime and stuff like that. So we said to the kid, hey, come and join us. You know, we'll, we'll call ourselves the Gramercy Park Sheiks. <laughs> and, uh, and here's a picture of us. That's Stefan on the left. That's me in the middle. And that's Ry Cooter on the right, who was the kid. <laughs> And uh, Rye was 17 years old. And... Okay, be honest with me. Do you think I gained any weight? No, no, no. Don't, don't be honest with me. And so, yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was a fun gig. And then we came back. We came back to uh, New York. And I had a paper due. I went back to school. We had taken a sabbatical, just Stefan and I. But then we went back. I was going to CW Post College on Long Island. Uh, which was owned by Marjorie Mer Mer Merriweather Post, whose daughter was the actress Dina Merrill. And they were so wealthy, Dina Merrill's dollhouse was my English, uh, was where I took my English course, you know. So we'd go into, we'd go, I'd go into class with a ceiling, you know, like this high. And well, there weren't dolls around, laying around, thank God. But uh, I had a paper due coming up. My term paper was going to be uh, on Yeats and the Byzantium, his Byzantium poems. Byzantium and sailing to Byzantium. Now, there's nothing more boring that I can think of in the world than to do a paper on Yeats and the Byzantium. There's nothing more boring to read than Yeats and the I couldn't get through. I couldn't get through a sentence without falling asleep. And then you had to parse the thing. It was just adjusting, you know, but I had to do it. I was an English lit major. My parents wanted me to be not only a doctor, they wanted me to be a lawyer and a doctor. And uh, I couldn't let them down. But something was happening called the 60s. And, uh, oh, what is that? Oh, oh my God, it's freaking out. Oh, oh okay. I can, do, do you like these stories or? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, and anyway, so uh, I was playing, uh, I was teaching at the Fred, Fred and Instruments on, uh, next to the uh, uh, Waverly Theater on 6th Avenue. This is 1965 now. And 
Dylan had just played the, the Newport Folk Festival, so all my friends in the village were trading in their acoustic guitars, going up to Manny's and getting electric guitars and starting blues bands. And uh, that's what we... Uh, so Greenwich Village was being bombarded by uh, kids from Long Island and from New Jersey, and they were coming in on the weekends and just, like, terrorizing this beautiful old Italian neighborhood. And uh, the f was, we were wondering what well, all the fuss was about, you know, the people that really you know, hung out there or lived there. Well, the fuss was about rock and roll. Um, and all these clubs sprung up. Aside from the, the uh, coffee shops, you had like the Bazaar, Cafe Bazaar, where Love and Spoonful would play. You had the Night Owl Cafe, where... Uh, James Taylor and the Flying Machine and uh, uh, Jerry Jeff Walker and the Circus Maximus, um, the Blues Project, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, around the corner, you walked around the corner and there was the Fugs had their own little theater. And uh, there was, and Ed Sanders used to be there rubbing his crotch for, for these little 14-year-old girls that would come. <laughs> I mean, he, it wasn't lascivious, it was just, it was just Ed being Ed. And, uh, and then, you know, like a few steps beyond that, you had the Café Wa. And the Café Wa, if you go down the Café Wa, you had Richie Havens. There was a basket place, and Richie was handing, you know, passing around the basket, you know, for money. And then he would open for a band called Jimmy James and the Flames. And Jimmy James and the Flames didn't stay very long because Jimmy James went to England and turned, changed his name to Jimi Hendrix. And this is what was going on in the village. And all the, the, the smells of espresso and from the coffee shops were still there, but you added pot to that, you know. And, and, uh, and it, was, it was just, it was an insane time. But I don't want to down, I mean, it was great. <laughs> it, was, it was a whole thing that's, that was happening. It was part of the counterculture God knows how many of these kids ran away, you know, to hit Ashbury or whatever, but it was the beginning of that, of that time, and it was a wonderful time. And so a friend of mine who also took lessons with Danny and with uh, Dave Van Ronk, his name was Danny Kalb, came up to the Waverly, uh, came up to the uh, fretted instruments where I was teaching, and he said, my, my rhythm guitar player was Artie Traum, went to Europe, and he needs a rhythm guitar player, would I be interested? I said, Danny, I can't even, I don't even, I don't know how to play an electric guitar. I know it has dials and you, you know, you stick like chords in it and stuff like that, but I don't know what to do with it. I've never, I've never played one. He said, well, come on up. We'll put a, what's called a Diarmond pickup into your acoustic and we'll plug you in and just play some blues. We're going to play, you know, some Muddy water stuff, high heel sneakers, you know, and by Tommy Tucker and, and <clears throat> let's see what you can do. So I went up the next day. Danny puts in my, my D. Armand pickup, but it was on 10. And of course, he didn't know. And then he plugs it into an amp that was also on 10 and not on standby. So this horrible sound came out of the amp. And I thought I was being attacked by a herd of rhinoceroses. And it wasn't until three acid trips later that I learned to love feedback. <laughs> and <laughs> anyway. Um, so I joined the Blues Project. I had such a great time, the first gig that I did, I had such a great time playing with other musicians, playing electric guitar loudly. I went out and got myself a Tom Jones shirt and bell-bottom pants. I started growing my hair long. I started smoking pot. I got a hippie girlfriend. I was in heaven. <laughs> of course, my parents wouldn't speak to me at all, but... <laughs> I was in heaven, and, uh, and so I had to make a choice at that point in my life. Do I go back to school and write a paper on Yeats and the Byzantium poems, <laughs> or do I be a musician and have the greatest time I'm, I'm having? Well, the fact is, look at me, I'm not your accountant, so <laughs> this, this is the choice I made. <laughs> So the Blues Project, we call ourselves the Blues Project. Um, we put um, Al Cooper on, uh, played on our first uh, demo. And Al really enjoyed himself and wanted to be in the band, so Al joined the band. 
And uh, we did an album, our first album. We had a horrible record company whose the budgets were really... We, I mean, two of our three albums were live, and one wasn't even entirely live. Uh, they, they were awful. And, but the first one was called Live at the Cafe of Gogo. And we rehearsed, you know, we, we played gigs in front of it before we recorded it. Um, and uh, there was one night when Roy's bass drum pedal broke, and so we had to do something. So I ran up to the uh, the microphone and sang one of my favorite songs at the time, which was Catch the Wind. And it went over really great, and the guys liked, liked it, and so we put it in our set, and we recorded it on our first album. Catch the Wind is by Donovan, and it wasn't until about a year ago that a friend of mine, Richard Barone, uh, who was friendly with Donovan, they were talking about Blues Project, uh, our version of Catch the Wind. And Donovan said, yeah, he really liked it. And um, so Richard said, well, why don't you send Steve an email saying that, you know, that you liked it, you know. He would love to, you know. So I got an email from Donovan saying, you know, I really liked, thank you for doing my song. And I, and I wrote back and I said, uh, well, yeah, it's only been 60 years, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, these are all true, these stories. Anyway, no, no, <laughs> that is true, actually. Like, I didn't say that to him. I, you know, I'm nicer than that, you know. I said, you little prick. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, this is... In the chilly hours and minutes Of uncertainty I want to be in the warm hold of your love and mine And to feel you all around me And to take your hand along the sand Ah, but I may as well try and catch the wind When sundown pales the sky I want to hide a while behind your smile And everywhere I'd look your eyes I'd find For me to love you now would be the sweetest thing It would make me sing Ah, but I may as well Try and catch the wind Hung the leaves with tears I want you near To kill my fears To help me to Leave all my blues behind Cause standing In your heart Is where I want to be I long to be Ah, but I may as well Try and catch the wind Ah, but I may as well Try and catch the wind 
Donovan. Thank you. Thank you. So we did a whole bunch of, uh, there we are backing up Chuck Berry uh, at the Village Theater. I think it, that, that's what became uh, the Fillmore. He was amazing. I mean, he, he didn't show up until the show. We didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> he would yell out, brown eyed handsome man, you know, and D. You know, it was, I mean, that's the way Chuck Berry was. And then I, I just read a, a new biography of uh, him, and he was really a nasty person. Whoa. Remember tuning? <laughs> <laughs> you don't like go to your synthesizer and put in no A sharp or you actually turn the knobs there's something very gratifying about tuning a guitar except for the audience I'm going from detuning into G tuning So we did a second album, Blues Project, and it was our only studio album. And it did quite well for, uh, we, we had no hit singles on it, but, but it was when radio started uh, becoming, radio is when FM radio started becoming really huge. And uh, so the great thing was, was that you could do long album cuts and they'd play it, you know, in some of the major stations and uh, FM stations across the country. And so we had a cult album and that was it. And Tom has about 1,200 copies of this. But Before I forget, I have a big thanks to throw out to Tom Cohn and his wife, Jan. Uh, for having me and putting me up and uh, just being wonderful people. you got to be crazy to do all of this you know? and that's why I love Tom and that's why I wanted to come back and um, Sam was doing a great job and I feel so comfortable uh, here and everybody here at the uh, I don't remember all the names but everybody that works at Bob shop is just a, a gem They're wonderful people <laughs> So we did uh, uh, projections, and this is when I started writing songs. Um, and in those days, you know, people started writing their own songs, and open, you know, playing open tunings and stuff like that, and and uh, fooling around with lyrics, and and so you had all these great writers coming out in in that generation, my generation. You know, if you listen to the songs, of course you have, the, the Joni Mitchell, they're, they're incredible. Um, you know, her changes, her playing, the, uh, the words, you know, and, you know, Neil Young, uh, so many of these people, Hendrix, and, uh, uh, the music was different, and uh, it was extraordinary, and we were all experimenting. And my, my uh, specialty was unrequited love songs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I wasn't political, you know, I mean, I was political, I was very political, but I couldn't write a political song, I, and I wasn't a blues singer, really, so I just uh, wrote unrequited love songs. I had these girlfriends, uh, 
that would come and live with me for a couple of weeks and then they would leave me and I would smoke a joint and have a shot of Jack Daniels and write a song. <laughs> and this kept happening over the years and I realized, oh my God, I'm into something here. <laughs> I'm getting royalty checks. So I would encourage women to walk out on me. And, uh, but that was a long time ago. I've been married 36 years now, so. God, I hope she's home when I get home. <laughs> Otherwise I'm gonna have to write another song. <laughs> so anyway, I wrote this song called September 5th. And um, we recorded it. And then we were, went on the road and uh, they, the, the, the record company, which is MGM was the mother company. The company was Verve Forecast, but MGM was the mother company. And the art department uh, called uh, our manager, who was a, a, a moron, and said, uh, hey, Jeff, we have the tapes. We have the artwork. What we're missing is the name of the second, of the second song on the first side. And Jeff goes, and we were on the road, right? You couldn't get in touch. And, and Jeff says, second song, first side. Second. Oh, that's Steve's song. Thanks, Jeff. I get off the road. And I look at the, the print, you know, the, the album, whatever it is. What the hell is Steve's song? <laughs> it's September 5th. What is Steve's song? I didn't write a song called Steve's song. They called it Steve's song. And I've had to live with this for, for all of these years, you know. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's horrible because, you know, you can have a puppy that died and you get another puppy, you know, and... Uh, but you know, I got to live with this forever, you know. So, you know, like this sitting over there, you know, turn it around. It still says Steve song. And people come up to me and they say, "Are you Steve?" And you know, I say, "Yeah, I'm Steve." <laughs> anyway, so I just want you to know that one of the reasons that I play for people that I'm playing out, at, especially at this delicate age, is because I want as many people to know that I would never, ever name a song after myself. <laughs> Anyway, we did it like, um, you, can, you, you can't call me from a snow-white starlit stairway. And, but this is how I wrote it. You can call me from a snow-white starlit stairway I may hear and not be far away at all But the sounds of our winter's love at night time They have vanished, they have silenced into fall You can crystallize through my mind's weary wanderings I may see your shadowed image on my wall Half staring, laughing, weaved by your indifference I would rather feel the pain than none at all If again I really see your face before me And we lie again together side by side Don't call me as I walk into the morning Please just realize that the pure has often died
September 5th. Thank you. Thank you. And there's another there's a, a poster from the uh, from the uh, Cafe Agogo. <laughs> I'm laughing because there's a we were, we were like the house band at the Cafe Ogogo. And um, I mean, everybody played at the Cafe Ogogo. If uh, you see any of the posters or, uh, you know, all the San Francisco bands, the Airplane, the Dead, everybody, all the, the, uh, the British bands played there, Cream. Uh, and then we'd had the, the blues, uh, you know, the jam sessions, B.B. King would play. And, and we played a lot with Muddy Waters Band, uh, which was just so so incredible, especially because I just loved it. And to this day, Otis Spann is like one of my favorite musicians in the world. And um, and those guys, it was uh, Otis Spann on piano and James Cotton on harmonica and, and Muddy. And uh, so we met some and played with some great people. Um, and. I'll never forget, I would go down early, you know, sometimes to the Bleecker Street Cinema was right next door, and I, would, I loved foreign movies, and I would go to the, see the, the, uh, the Bleecker Street Cinema before rehearsal. And then if I got to rehearsal early, I'd go downstairs and just, like, hang out at the Cafe or Gogo. There was one afternoon that uh, I went down uh, to the Cafe or Gogo. I was early, and I go into the bathroom. I had, I had to pee, and I was standing in front of the urinal, and I hear... Bobby Kennedy in the uh, in a stall talking to himself, and I'm thinking, what the hell is Bobby Kennedy doing in a stall talking to himself on a Thursday afternoon in Greenwich Village? This is like the strangest thing, and it was it, it was I really was weird. So I ran out to Howard Solomon who owned the place, and I I said, Howard, Bobby Kennedy's in a stall in the bathroom talking to himself. And Howard said, that's David Fry, the impersonator. <laughs> that's your opening act tonight. I said, thank God, because I, I had these horrible thoughts that, you know, I would go back in and, because and, and his, his, his uh, specialty was, was, was Richard Nixon. And wouldn't it be horrible if he and Richard Nixon and Bobby Kennedy were having a conversation in the, in the stall? Thank God. Well, this is what pot did to you, you know, in those days. <laughs> anyway, so some of our posters are really fabulous. That was the first family dog poster and uh, the Avalon Ballroom. And uh, that's it. it's in The Graduate, actually, but our opening act was The Great Society with, uh, ja um, with Grace before she joined the airplane. And uh, there's uh, Avalon again and our opening act, Sons of Adam and Quicksilver Messenger Service. And that's just around the time of the Monterey Pop Festival. And uh, that's one of, is that, was that Mouse's? I forgot who, Tom? Do you, was that Mouse, Stanley Mouse? I forgot. Anyway. Um, who? This is that Miscoso. Yes, thank you. Is Tom here? I thought uh, maybe. Oh, Tom is here. I was going to take back all my thank yous. Um, that was at the Matrix again, and this is these two are my favorite. That's uh, uh, the opening acts were Jimmy Reed and John Lee Hooker, and this one that that was uh, the, the Fillmore. The opening acts here were the can't were can't heat and the mothers of invention. Oh, a great poster. Now this is a this is an incredible show that we did. Murray the K's last show, the 59th Street RKO show, was the first time Who in America, the first time Cream was in America. Of course, they call them the Cream, <laughs> and uh, the headliners were uh, were. Uh, Wilson Pickett and Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels. It was supposed to be Smokey Robinson also and the Miracles, but Smokey, Smokey knew that Murray wasn't going to pay any of us. <laughs> but on the weekends were Simon and Garfunkel and the Blues Magoos and, um, 
And it, it, this is an amazing thing. It lasted like nine days. We, we, we were limited to three songs per show. And um, it was like five shows a day. And it was, it was, it was just amazing. It was, it was an amazing time. We shared a dressing room with Cream. And uh, I'll never forget when, when uh, the first day, and it was like 9 a.m., I had to be there early, and the door slams open, and this redheaded lunatic throws a bottle of vodka at me and says, here, have some. And it was Ginger Baker who was out of his mind, right? Later on, uh, Ginger and I became friendly. We went down to, uh, we went out down to the village and had dinner at the, the dugout, and we drank a lot of beers and... Uh, and then I said, let's go to, to Gertie's Folk City, which was across a field, which is now a building of NYU, but it was, then it was just a field. So I said, let's go and, you know, and, and uh, another bar, we'll listen to some music. So we're halfway there, and Ginger bends over and throws up. And I, I said to him, are you okay? He said, aren't we going to another bar? <laughs> <laughs> this is a quaint British custom that I wasn't used to. <laughs> But that was an amazing. Actually, Pete, Pete Townsend has done some interviews also with uh, with people with magazines about this show. Somebody should really write a book about it. And uh, I mean, backstage, you know, the the the, the jam sessions with with uh, Clapton and uh, and Pickett and uh, Buddy Miles, who was who was in uh, Pickett's band. In fact, the band Pickett's band they were screwing like fourteen year old groupies down below the. Uh, it was, it was just all kinds of wacky things. Buddy Miles was, was the drummer, and, and Mike Bloomfield came to every show to try to talk Buddy into joining Electric Flag, which we eventually did. Um, but I got friendly with the uh, bass player, uh, Pick, Pickett's bass player. And uh, what Pickett would do is he would fine his musicians $5 for every mistake that he heard. And none of us got paid, right? So I ran into the bass player at the Steve Paul's The Scene uh, one night, and I said, hey, how did you guys do? He said, I wound up owing Pickett $35. <laughs> the world of being a musician. It's another one of our uh, publicity photos taken by Jim Marshall. That was the same day that the, the, the uh, projections was taken at uh, Haight-Ashbury. Here's a cute one. This is The Who opening for The Blues Project. <laughs> Richie Havens and the Who opening for us. Well, this is like, you know, it's, it's, we have this weird history, you know, like, well, I do, you know, it's Blood, Sweat, and Tears. We won a Grammy uh, for Album of the Year, and we beat out Abbey Road. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> uh, ah. So this was uh, our last album together, um, the... Uh, Blues Project. It was called Live at Town Hall. Half the album was actually done in the studio, and they put uh, the record company put applause uh, after the tracks, and uh, and then hired some drunk out on the street. Hey, can you come come here? Do you know how to turn a knob? We need to mix a couple of things. Sure, I can mix. And they mixed our. Uh, our album, or a bunch of songs, including this song, which is the worst mix ever. My voice is so far out front that the band is like, they're on their way somewhere else. And um, this was written by uh, my good friend Pat Patrick Skye, who died, I think, just last year. First I came to town I came in from the country Not a penny did I have I 
one cent could I offer But still our love it grew And our troubles They were few They were few Many times I try to tell you Of all the hurt that I was feeling But thoughts stumbled in my mind And words there lost their meaning I didn't mean to cause you pain So I'm leaving once again, once again And as for you, your tears will heal all the wounds that might have opened Just like time will clear the fields Of all the flowers that have ripened Of all these things you can be sure Only love will Okay, so here's some more stuff. Uh, the blues bag, every, every Thanksgiving, Howard would run this thing at the Cafe of Go-Go called the blues bag, and every, the jams were just unbelievable. Um, here we're playing Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, Richie Havens, and here, here's another one. Uh, oh. Steve Katz, ex Blues Project star. <laughs> it's funny. So we played Monterey Pop Festival, and that was like the, one of the last gigs that we did, and that was amazing. I played Woodstock also, which I hated. I, into that another time but uh monterey was was fantastic um i shook hands with otis redding um i was at the side of the stage when janice did uh, ball and chain with big brother um it was just great and i had dinner with Jimi hendrix it was a hot dog stand in the back but <laughs> still dinner with Jimi hendrix and um he was friendly with our keyboard player at the time, John John McDuffie. So the three of us, you know, had dinner. And my book company, when my book came out, they they promoted it as Steve jammed with such and such and jammed with such and such, jammed with Jimi Hendrix. I never jammed with Jimi Hendrix. I shared a bag of potato chips with Jimi Hendrix, which I think is a lot cooler. Everybody's jammed with Jimi Hendrix, but how many people have shared a bag of potato chips? Anyway, so we... Uh so we sort of broke up, and well, we did break up, and um, Al Cooper had left before Monterey. Uh, Al played solo at Monterey. He played all of our songs, and then we had to go on. But that was Al. Anyway, um, so we, 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 then I got a call from Al a couple of months later. 
um, he says, I'm, I, I want to move to England and start, you know, just start my career again. Uh, would you and, uh, you know, a couple of guys back me up at the, at the uh, Cafe of Gogo to do a benefit to raise money for me to go to uh, England? I said, sure. So my friend Bobby Columbi and I, um, uh, and uh, I think uh, Fre- he got, uh, Bobby got Freddie Lipsius and, and uh, Al got Jimmy Fielder, um, who was with the Buffalo Springfield Mothers of Invention, and uh, and we uh, backed up uh, Al at the at the Cafe of Gogo. But uh, the only people that showed up uh, gave enough money to Al to take a cab to the airport and back. So he said, "Well, you might as well stay. You know, <laughs> let's start a band." You know? And uh, that's what we did. And um, you know, Al had this concept uh, for blood for the blues project of having horns in the band, which Danny Nix, Danny was the head of the band, and um, I liked the idea. And Al and I were both listening to a, an album by the Buckinghams called "Time and Charges," where they use the uh, uh, the horn section from the Chicago Symphony, but they didn't do stock R and B horns. So we really liked the idea of being able to take uh, a horn section on the road with us that wasn't doing stock R&B charts. And um, so we put together a horn section, and uh, and it just turned out it, was, it just wasn't a horn section that you just put on salary. You know, when you have Randy Brecker and Fred Lipsius and, and those guys, they were, they were great. We had a great horn section that brought their own personalities into the band. And um, yeah, so... We called it Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and uh, we, uh, uh, we we made our first album, which is called Child is Father to the Man, which uh, is, a, is a great album. I mean, I, I even love it, you know. Um, we had problems with, uh, some problems with it, but mainly, we did it in two weeks, which is really unheard of for an album that was... Uh, it, it actually made rock and roll's top uh, 500,000 albums of the year. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so this cover was like sort of uh, pre Photoshop uh, strange, you know, with the kids with our own heads, kids on our laps. This was so painful. These are the real kids. I hated these little bastards. <laughs> they, were, they were like. They were like models hired for this, and, and, you know, hey, mom, get me off of this guy's, this hippie's lap. I hate this, you know. Screw you, you little bastard. <laughs> what, the kids? Half of them are dead probably now. It was one of our pro, pro, promo pictures. This is my favorite poster, actually. I have it at home, and I don't think there's another one at all. Um, it's a boxing poster, which is, and you find in cities all over, you know, for boxing matches or rock and roll bands. And uh, this was when we first went out and played a club, well, the second club we played. We played the Cafe of Gogo. Actually, with the Cafe of Gogo, we opened for Moby Grape. And uh, then we played Steve Paul's The Scene. And this was the uh, the poster. Uh, the Chambers Brothers opened for us. But look at the uh, the MC was Tiny Tim. I love Tiny Tim. I used to go early uh, to the gig so I can just sit and talk with Tiny because Tiny was an expert in music from the 30s and the 20s, and um, he was just incredible to talk to. And he was like it was an encyclopedia of this stuff, and you really learned a lot. And he was, he was very, he was just a really nice guy. So I would, I would get up and walk away after talking to him and think, you know, he's really so straight, you know. And then I would say to myself five minutes later, what am I, out of my mind? <laughs> uh, this is our first uh, big gig at the Village Theater. And uh, this was when... Uh, <laughs> I, I said to Bobby, uh, the drummer in Columbia, I said, Let, let's drive over. He had a car, uh, which very few people had in those days. <laughs> let's drive over to the, uh, to the Fillmore, I mean, to the um, Village Theater, and, and, and see our name up in lights, you know, 
can see what it looks like on the marquee. So we draw over there, and it says, Al Cooper's Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And I freaked out. And I said, I'm, so I, I started screaming at the people, you know, who really couldn't give a shit, you know. I was like, hey, you know, you got to change that. It's not Al Cooper's Blood, Sweat, and Tears. This is a democracy, this band, as if he cared what the band was. So he says, you guys, go out and have lunch, come back, and it'll change it. So they changed it to Al Cooper and Steve Katz, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. I said to Bobby, I can live with that. <laughs> what year would this have been? That was 67. 67. Yeah. And uh, this is an uh, opening for Cream at Winterland. And I put that up there because backstage, this is backstage at Winterland, that's me and Eric smoking a joint together. <laughs> this is a picture of uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears where um, uh, Al Cooper is dressed as a hostess Twinkie. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great poster also at the Grandy Ballroom uh, in Detroit because our opening act was the Psychedelic Stooges, Iggy and the Stooges. So, our first album, I had a, a song that I'm not going to do because it's a, a nasty little song about a, a, a girl that left me and... Uh, and uh, I wasn't happy about it. <laughs> Even getting the royalties didn't help. Actually, I forgot the chords. Um, but, uh, but I did another song that uh, uh, from my, my old friend Tim Buckley um, did, uh, wrote and, and recorded. Um, Tim was a great, great musician. And uh, he died from an overdose at the age 29. Lit my purest candle close to my window, hoping it would catch the eye of any vagabond who passed it by. And I waited in my fleeting house. Before he came, I felt him drawing near And as he neared, I felt the ancient fear That he had come to wound my door and jeer And I waited in my fleeting house Tell me stories I called to the hobo Stories of old I knelt to the hobo Stories of cold I wept to the hobo And he stood before me my fleeting house No, said the hobo, no more tales of time Don't ask me now to wash away the grime I can't come in cause it's too high a climb And he stood before me in my fleeting House. Then you be damned, I screamed to the hobo Turn into stone, I knelt to the hobo 
leave me alone I wept to the hobo and he walked away from my fleeting house I lit my purest candle close to my window hoping it would catch the eye of any vagabond who passed it by and he walked away from my fleeting house Thank you. Thank you. So, we got ourselves a, a new lead singer, and uh, the story's in the book. By the way, my book will be, I'll be selling my book uh, after the show. It's going to be up there. It's really, uh, it's, it's a fabulous book. Um, there's there's lots of sex uh, and lots of uh, pictures, sexy pic. No, I'm just kidding. Is it? No, it's just a bunch of gossip and uh, no. I, it's a memoir that I wanted to make entertaining, and uh, people have been really loving it. So and it's not that expensive. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, so. Uh, we, we did this uh, album, and uh, it became a huge hit. We had three huge hit singles uh, on it. And uh, our first, uh, it went to number 16 uh, in cash box, because I would call every week and, and get the, you, you could get the, uh, the next week's uh, standings you know, of your album if you were a musician or a manager. And I called one week, and uh, he said, well, the album went up to 16, the secretary. He said, 16, well, that's not bad. That's great, actually, had an album to go up to 16. I'm happy about that. I'm really happy about that. And then, <clears throat> like 10 minutes later, I get a call from the same woman. She said, you know, I didn't even think to look at number one. The album went to number one. And... Uh, you know, and our singles are big hits, and after our first single, You Made Me So Very Happy, it was a hit. <coughs> Excuse me. I got a call from my mother, who wasn't speaking to me for a while because they were so disappointed in me. And um, so I pick up the phone, hi, Mom. She says, Stephen, we knew it all along. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. And <laughs> Mom, could you help me open this goddamn thing? <laughs> okay, there you go. Ah. And uh, I mean, there are so many stories. I guess, uh, you know, we went on the road, and, uh, you know, in those days when you have hit records, you don't just play Detroit and Columbus, you play every college in between. And so it was really a lot of hard work, and people say, oh, God, you, you know, we never had the time to throw television sets out the window or anything like that. And we weren't that type of, of band anyway. In fact, we were really dull. We were so dull that I hang, hung out with the roadies who were not dull. <laughs> they were great. They were very funny. Um, in fact, uh, one year I said to John, I said, uh, John Chesler was our roadie, he said, I said, John, how much did you, uh, did you embezzle this year? <laughs> he said about $30,000. <laughs> <I couldn't, laughs> 
he and our other roadie and our sound man, Bill, we were in San Francisco, then we went to L.A., and they had loved this, this uh, seafood restaurant on uh, in Fisherman's Wharf, Wharf. So they're walking along in L.A., you know, we had a day off, and they look at each other and say, God, that place was great. Well, we have the band's American Express card. They went up and had dinner <laughs> and <laughs> used our American Express card. Rock and roll. Anyway. But those guys were really, really funny. Um, okay, I guess this is where I talk about the movie. There's a movie that just came out that's been in theaters, um, art theaters. Uh, evidently, it hasn't been in Rochester yet. Uh, Tom's going to fix that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. There's a movie called what, what the Hell Happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears? I didn't know this was going to happen uh, until I got a call from uh, this wonderful filmmaker, John Scheinfeld, who did uh, the Harry Nielsen, the great Harry, Harry Nielsen uh, biography, and also uh, um, uh, the, the, the John Coltrane. Uh, was it Catching Train, I think? Chasing, Chasing Train did that and John Lennon versus the USA and I get an email from John saying am I available to do an interview I said for what he says I'm making a film about blood sweat and tears I said what are you crazy I said, why you know and he had uh, lunch with Bobby Columbia the drummer out on the west coast and uh, he said to Bobby what the hell happened to blood sweat and tears and Bobby told him a story about our tour of Eastern Europe and John picked it up and said, this is fantastic. I have to make a film of this. I'll tell you what it's about. Um, our singer, David, this is when we were like the number one band in America. And uh, our singer, David, had a felony record, juvenile record in Canada. I don't even know what for, you know, maybe car theft or something. So here we are, very popular band. The Nixon administration decided to take advantage of this. And they made a deal with us to uh, do a, a tour of Eastern Europe representing, of course, American youth, which was total bullshit. And, if, and in that case, they would let David stay in, uh, in, in America and not take, get rid of his visa. Uh, this is blackmail as extortion. But there was nothing we could do about it. And it really hurt us and hurt our career. And so Blood, Sweat, and Tears is not, is, you know, you don't think of it today as one of the, I mean, we're not, we're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We'll never be in the, you know, we just got killed when we came back from Eastern Europe because we got killed by the left for representing the Nixon administration, even though we were so against it and made speeches and stuff like that against it, made no difference. And we got killed by the right because, you know, we, we were, you know, long-haired musician, hippie. Was, we just got killed. And John saw a story in this. And not only did he do a beautiful job directing this movie, and uh, some of us were, uh, were interviewed, but he did a beautiful job. Uh, he did a beautiful job with detective work. He found people that came to our concert in uh, Romania from 53 years ago. And, and Warsaw, and interviewed them. He found uh, letters, uh, he found a memo from Kissinger to Nixon that Nixon sent back to Kissinger saying, let's take advantage of these guys, you know, their tour. And the film, it's, it's very moving for me because it vindicated us. We, we got killed and, and this film vindicated us. And it's out now. It's not streaming yet, it will be, my guess is that it's in negotiation with Netflix or one of the one of the, the companies. Um, I've been doing uh, uh, I've been introducing doing Q and A after the film, um, and uh, Tom and Jan saw it today, and Andy if he's here, and because uh, uh, they sent me a copy of it, and uh, you're not allowed to see it. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> no it, it, it'll be streaming at some point um, or. Hopefully, Tom will get it into a theater, and I'll come back and, and do a Q&A. But the thing is, it's not just, it's a great film. It's really a good film. I, I didn't think that it was, I didn't think, well, how can he make a great film out of this? But when I saw it, 
I freaked. First of all, it was so emotional for me. You know, for, he found out so many things. Anyway, I'm just making you aware of uh, of the fact that this film is there, and um, and um, so that was that cover. This is the original cover um, without the heads. It was done by the Quay brothers, uh, who are video artists that are American but living their twins, and they live in England, and they're famous among the art art crowd. This is in the Museum of Modern Art collection. There's a marquee of us, the Grateful Dead, and uh, Jimi Hendrix at, uh, you know, coming attractions at uh, the Fillmore. That's a goofy thing in, uh, I think it's the Electric Circus in uh, Philadelphia. And we won the Grammy. It was handed to us, and this is like a highlight of my life. It was handed to us by Louis Armstrong. And that is a picture of the Grammy. And that's a chart of, uh, I think that's on When I Die? Yeah. Went to the one. That's my quadruple platinum record, which is hanging in my house because my wife won't let me hang all my other records, gold records. The reason is, is because my wife is an artist and she thinks they're ugly. <laughs> I have to agree, you know, I mean, that's, so I, I keep this one in my office. Here's a, uh, we, did, we did a bunch of benefits. Um, this one uh, was mainly anti-war stuff. Um, we, a we actually raised the money for the students of uh, Kent State that were uh, indicted, and we raised the money for the, their defense. Um, you can see who's in this one. Oh. Harry Belafonte and us and uh, Judy Collins and Hendrix and uh, yeah, it was pretty Rascals. amazing. Rascals. Peter, Paul, and Mary, the Rascals. And here's a a flyer from the film where with the uh, yeah that's the uh, is that the Jethro Tull opening for us or <laughs> and this is uh, when the Allman Brothers were our opening act. This Miles Davis is our opening act. Opening act. <laughs> it's, I'm telling you, you ought to read the book. You know, it's not that expensive. Um, that's uh, me playing a wrong note and everybody in the band laughing at me. It's me as a kid. So I'm going to tell you a story. That's, yeah, that's the, uh, oh, God, Woodstock, so horrible. It was raining, and, and you know, we're at 2 a.m. Um, oh, I know what I have to get to. Oh, yeah, this, this is a, a cassette was taken to the moon by one of the astronauts. I don't know which one. Um, it was after uh, Neil Armstrong. And, the, and he took, he had a cassette of his favorite things, and one of, my, one of them was... My, one of my songs, and um, and so I had dinner with some friends. And I said, "Geez, I just found out that my song went to the moon." They said, "Well, did he leave it there?" I said, I said "No." He said, "Well, that's nothing." I said, "It went to the moon for Christ's sake." Um, this is the uh, uh, the logo for the movie, and if, if you Google it, you can the trailer is all over the internet. So. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, there's a CD of the uh, of us doing that. It was pretty. You know, one thing that 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 was amazed me was that we were really good. I mean, <laughs> I couldn't believe how we played, and we were played great in this thing, and and it was just pretty amazing. Um, I watched it so many times that the last time I I saw it, I. I would make comments to my wife, and I said, "You know, this time when I saw it, I, I noticed that my my gums look really good." <laughs> <laughs> so, so we were like a a, a huge hit band, and um, and 
like I said, you know, you had to play all the gigs in between. And, um, and there was one, it was around the time of the moratorium marches, the, the big one, actually. It was in uh, October of, uh, of uh, 69. <clears throat> it was an amazing time of year. The Mets were in the World Series with the Baltimore Orioles, first time Mets were in the series. And there were moratorium marches all over the place. The biggest one was in New York. And it was huge, anti-war march. And, um, you know, and stores closed and everything like that. It was great. And about a month before that happened, I went to the band and I, you know, because we had, we were booked. I went to the band and I said, listen, guys, uh, I, I love the band. I love what we're doing. I love the music. I'm, you know, but I can't work that day. I have to march against this war. As much as the band means to me, marching against the war means more to me. And so you can fire me, you can get a substitute, you can you know, cancel the gig. It makes no difference because I have to march that day. So they canceled the gig, right? Which I knew they were gonna do. So the night before the uh, march, I get a call from a friend. I got an extra ticket to the game tomorrow. <laughs> So, so what you have is, is Ron Swoboda making a catch that I saw in person. I know, it was horrible. I should. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the guys in the band know about it until they, if, they, if they read my book, then they'll know. About it. And that's in Zagreb, in Yugoslavia, part of that, that tour. Um, that's uh, my mother and Alice Cooper. <laughs> Anyway, getting back to, <laughs> and that's that's not uh, AI. That's uh, the real thing. Yeah. Of course, if it was AI, who would take the time to put my mother and Alice Cooper together? So, uh, I'm going to play. Um, actually, my final song tonight um, is from this album, um, and it's about a girl that walked out on me. I smoked a joint, I had a... <laughs> and what's really great is that um, well, the, the Coen brothers put this into Fargo. This is very Sometimes in winter I gaze into the streets and walks through snow and city sleet behind your room Sometimes in winter Forgotten memories Remember you behind the trees With leaves that cry By the window once I waited for you Laughing slightly you would run Trees alone would shield us in the meadow Making love in the evening sun Now you're gone girl And the lampposts call your name I can hear them in a spring of frozen rain Now you're gone, girl And the time slow down till dawn It's a cold room And the walls ask where you've gone Sometimes in winter 
I love you in the good times Seems like memories in the spring That never came Sometimes in winter I wish the empty streets would fill with laughter from your tears to ease my pain Thank you and good night Thank you so much. You've been a terrific audience. Oh. Okay, so. Oh. It's hard to top that last one, man. That's a great song. Oh, thank you. Um, where are we? <laughs> okay, so I, when I left Blood, Sweat, and Tears, I. Um, I was getting friendly with Lou Reed, and I produced this album, Rock and Roll Animal. And uh, working with Lou was a lot of fun. It was sort of like being in solitary confinement for six years or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, produced Elliot Murphy, and that's a good album. And... Um, and here we go. Uh, this is the last band I was in. So there I was. I started out in a jug band. I wound up in a psychedelic blues band, went from there to a jazz rock horn band, and from here I went to a country rock band. So I'm just waiting for it to do like some Romanian folk music. And, uh, <laughs> uh, here's a picture of me with a... Uh, oh, well, first, let me tell you about American Flyer was the name of the band. It was myself, Craig Fuller um, from Pure Prairie League, and uh, Eric Has, who Eric uh, wrote a lot of songs for Bonnie Raitt and uh, Linda Ronstadt, and uh, Doug Ewell from the Velvet Underground. And um, we, uh, we, we there was a there was a bidding war by the major companies for us, you know. And <coughs> finally, this guy, uh, Al Teller, who was the head of United Artists, comes to us and he says, listen, I can't afford to give you guys uh, the same money that you know, Columbia and RCA are offering you, but is there anything that, I, that, that, that could put me in, in competition? You know, is there anything that I can do for you guys? And we were joking around. We said, yeah, get George Martin to produce us. And that's what Al did. <laughs> So we did this album with, uh, and there's, uh, the, there's me and George. And that's at uh, Indigo Ranch in Malibu. And uh, so we spent a month working with George, which was incredible. George was George. Whatever you think of George, he was like that. He was an elegant, fantastically intelligent, so creative and so talented. Just a wonderful, very charismatic person. Great looking guy, you know, he's just a, a joy to work with. And, um, and I kept following around. How did you do this with the Beatles and how did you do that with the Beatles? <laughs> and uh, it, it's amazing what I learned, you know, and how much George did, you know, all the keyboard work that he did and, and the arrangements. And he did a lot of the background arrangement, the background vocal arrangements. There was one song um, on our album that he, he said, uh, okay, I want you guys to go in and do nim, 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 nim. And we thought he was crazy. And we did it. He puts it in the background, and it sounded perfect. And that's a great producer. And um, it was a joy to work with, uh, with George. 
And this is a song that I wrote for that album called Back in 57. And uh, I better get out my glasses just in case. Uh, I didn't, I just started using glasses because I didn't want to forget words and feel like a total jerk. Um, and this, you know, I, I, this is great psychologically to have this here, although I don't look at it that much, uh, the lyrics, you know, but, uh, and, but it keeps getting closer, you know, as I get older. I keep putting it closer and closer. <laughs> Pretty soon I'll be singing like this. <laughs> That's when I quit. Sleep, little girl. Your candle in a cold, cold world. And I'm the lucky one, afraid as I am. I know I'm your only man. I feel like a child. I need your body close to mine And friends for life ain't easy to find But you, you were a friend of mine I thought I was a man in high school But you can only be a man for a woman who gives you love and treats you good gives you everything she could and back in 57 I believed in heaven someday and back in 57 I believed in heaven someday Sleep, little one Your rainbow in my morning sun And as I wake up All my thoughts seem so great But you, you are a rainbow today feel like a boy now in the same ways I felt like a man in my high school days I've been bought and I've been sold But that's just rock and roll And back in 57 I believed in heaven someday Whoa Back in 57, I believe in heaven someday. Thank you again and good night. Thank you.